Hundreds of thousands of researchers around the world are working to improve life and address imminent threats to humanity. Often their research ends up in the scientific valley of death in the form of publications and patents that never see the light of day. That is about to change. Welcome to the Lab to Startup podcast, hosted by Naresh Sankara, founder and executive director of the Berkeley Postdoc Entrepreneurship Program at the University of California, Berkeley. This show has two main goals. Share the stories of those who have successfully founded startups based on their own research and highlight resources needed to help those aspiring to launch startups in the deep tech space. Whether it's electric cars, vaccines, addressing climate change concerns, or possibly establishing life on other planets, Naresh and his esteemed guests want to help scientists, engineers, faculty, and researchers bring their innovations to market. Learn more and subscribe today at labtostartup.com. And now, here's Naresh. Hi, everyone. My guest today is Amanda Cashin, the co-founder and global head of Illumina Accelerator, which focuses on building genomics-driven startups. In this conversation, we talk about the Accelerator program, sequencing support, seed funding, training, and the selection process for startups. We talk about how the Accelerator is partnering with leading venture capital investors to help the startups that go through the program in San Francisco and Cambridge, UK. We will also discuss the latest partnership with Sequoia Capital to support an incubator in China. And finally, we close the conversation with the future vision and how next-gen sequencing is going to advance healthcare. I hope you enjoy and learn from my conversation. Welcome to the show, Amanda. I'm super excited to have you as a guest because Illumina is one of the best accelerators I have seen personally while working with the startup a couple of years ago. Thank you for coming here. Naresh, thanks so much for having me and th- congrats to your new podcast. It's super fun awesome. to see you getting out there and talking about entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you. So for the sake of audience, can you please give an overview of the Accelerator program at Illumina? But before we get into the details, let us start with some basics. What startups do you consider as genomic startups? Happy to talk about Illumina Accelerator and happy to talk about what our companies are, what they do. So genomic startups is pretty broad. It ranges anything from therapeutics, pushing the boundary of developing new gene therapies for rare diseases, to diagnostics, folks working in infectious diseases, trying to develop new diagnostics for infectious diseases, to synthetic biology, developing new materials for different applications, to consumer applications of genomics, to agriculture applications of genomics. So it's pretty broad. Actually, we think about more what's out of scope, which is very minimal. It's really what's out of scope for us is companies that are too close to Illumina's core. We're not investing in companies that are doing DNA sequencing technologies, for example. Everything else, people who are using our platform, our next generation sequencing platform upstream or downstream, those are the types of companies and entrepreneurs that we love to work with. Oh, thanks for clarification. Yes, now into the accelerator. So Illumina Accelerator, as you kind of said, it's a company creation engine focus on building genomics-driven startups. So we work with teams that are very early stage, some that are a little further along, but usually teams that have raised less than a few million dollars that we really kind of help them build their business, develop their technology, advance their approach, and really kind of launch the the company. So we have a six-month funding cycle. Teams come on site to our innovation center, either here in the San Francisco Bay Area or in Cambridge, UK, where we also have an innovation center. And they hang out with us for six months and we really are all in. We work with three to five companies during that six month funding cycle and we provide them with four key resources, capital and access to capital through our network. And I'm happy to go into each one of these, but we'll just start with the high level. The second is sequencing. They use our technology and they generate really, really important technology in value inflection milestones by generating a lot of high quality data on our platforms. The third is coaching, and that's building a business from the ground up, helping them with our internal and external coaches. And then the last is the lab and office space we have in the Bay Area and also in Cambridge, UK. So that's sort of the overview of of Illumina Accelerator. And really, we're very hands-on company creation folks. We have a number of folks on our team that really kind of help these teams from the get-go. Thank you for that overview. I think you touched upon a few things. The first one was capital. One of the biggest issues that faces founders in the deep tech space, like in the genomics is funding. You highlighted partnering with leading venture capital investors on your website. Can you talk about what seed funding you provide and what are these partnerships about? The capital resources that we have all comes from our network. We have a few dedicated sources of capital up front. 
And then also in the UK, we have a dedicated fund waiting for the teams when they graduate in the UK, when they raise a certain amount of capital. But that access to capital is super important. And what's really, really cool these days is you see a lot of investors wanting to participate in the life science ecosystem and invest and really make an impact. We're very grateful that we have a number of startups that have been able to raise, for example, during the COVID pandemic. I think because life science and genomics innovations is the spotlight, is at the center stage in so many ways, not that we want it to be, but I think folks are now really valuing the impact that life science and genomics and healthcare companies can really make and saving lives and transforming human health. So there's a lot of investors who are jumping in and that's investors both from the life science side and the tech side and anything in between really who are wanting to make a difference and really improve human health and beyond by investing in not just genomics companies, but I think a lot of life science companies in the field. So we're seeing a lot of interest there. And maybe Naresh, if I could sort of shout out a a couple of stats we have on the capital side. So we have now 54 companies that have graduated Illumina Accelerator. We just welcomed seven new companies across our two sites this past week. And so combined, our graduates have raised a little over $1 billion in third-party venture capital, which is really cool. It's all third-party funding from leading top-tier investors, a lot of angel investors, a lot of folks who are investing early stage, later stage, folks who are jumping into the game. And then we also have really cool stats on the number of companies that have attracted additional capital once they've come to Illumina Accelerator. It's about 93% of our teams have gone on to raise additional capital, which is really cool. I think if you think about how early we start and how just challenging life sciences in general, Rush, you know that you're an entrepreneur yourself. (laughs) <laughs> it's really cool to see. We, we've been able to work with really great teams who have been able to attract capital and really continue to build their businesses and achieve their milestones. Those are some very impressive stats there. Doing a great job there. Maybe you can help us understand a bit more. Let's go a little deeper. Walk me through the process. If a startup is accepted to the program, just stick to the funding. So what happens in terms of how do you help them? If you can take an example and talk about it. So there's a couple of ways we help entrepreneurs raise capital. So the first is we provide access to convertible notes when they come in the door. So we work with a couple of different capital partners. So each entrepreneur will have access to up to 200K in convertible notes from third-party investors. So that's available to the entrepreneurs. It's not required for them to take it, but a lot of them do because it helps them get a little bit further. And it comes at set terms. And so a lot of that information is on our website, but briefly, and the convertible note has a $5 million dollar valuation cap, a 20% discount, and a 6% interest. Those are pretty standard terms, but happy to kind of talk to anybody who's interested in learning more about that. But again, that's at the option of the entrepreneur that those convertible notes are available to folks. Oh, this is very optional. It's very optional. And, but we work with great partners. So a lot of the startups do take the capital because they like the firms that we work with. But also we have a great network of investors, both super early stage angel investors, but also later stage traditional VCs and even later stage folks who are used to investing in publicly traded companies, but also are investing in venture backed companies as well. So we'll introduce them to our network. We do a number of sort of office hours and get coaching and advice from different really high quality life science and technology VCs to help the team sort of get introduced to the world of investors and help them tell their story and help them define some of their milestones. And then during the whole six months, we're coaching them on how do they tell their story. And I think when it comes to capital and fundraising, how you tell your story sometimes is underestimated because we're all focused on sort of the business and building it out and maybe even the technology, developing new IP. But if you can't communicate your story and if you can't get folks to join you in your journey, whether it's a new team member joining your journey or whether it's an investor joining your journey, then you have to really spend time thinking about your story and how do you tell it to create this compelling vision that will really help set your company for success. And I think that's something when you're talking about fundraising and fundraising tips, it's really focus on your story and appreciate the art that it is and communicating tough topics in a short amount of time frame. So we have like a 20 minute sort of recommended presentation format, 15 minutes of presentation, five minutes of Q&A. Within that 15 minutes of presentation, you should have 12 slides and you should not go over that because you should be able to tell your story in a clear and succinct way, no matter how deep the technology is, no matter how complicated the market is, no matter how interesting the story is, you got to keep it short and sweet. And then you can always dive in further. So storytelling is a big piece of the time that we work with the teams and helping them raise capital is helping them tell their story. And then the second piece is really trying to find the right investors to talk to. And really importantly, viewing the investor as a potential partner, not just a check, not just a source of capital, not even just a source of smart capital. It's a relationship that you're entering into as an entrepreneur when you 
accept capital from an investor. So when you're building that relationship as you're talking or you're courting different investors, really, really view that as sort of a, one of many conversations that you're going to have. If they are an investor, of course, it's with a long-term relationship because then they'll be a shareholder for the life of your company. So really thinking about investors' conversations as a relationship that you're building and that you're also evaluating these investors if they're somebody that you want to spend time with, if they're somebody that you could imagine having a drink with or having a coffee with and calling up and asking for advice or chatting about whatever the new development is at your company. So really thinking about the investor as a partner on the personal level and an individual level, because I think that's sometimes what founders sometimes miss is that sometimes you really get thinking about just, okay, got to raise the money, got to raise the money. But more importantly, it's you got to form the right partnerships and do that with the right people. So investors fall into that category too. So don't forget that. You make a very good point. I've seen this with a lot of founders. They see this as a transaction as opposed to a relation building process. But that is so important. That is very important. And you went back to the storytelling a minute ago. Have you found it hard with scientists particularly because I'm a scientist and we're used to so much of data. We love our technology and like we forget to tell a good story. What have you learned in terms of teaching them storytelling in the past seven, eight years? You've been there? Yeah, seven years. It is a total art. And it's so interesting. I think sometimes it's a just an innate skill that some folks have who are really good at creating a compelling vision and sharing their passion and getting others to kind of share that passion. And there's some who have a hard time grasping it. One of the best storytellers, this is a funny story. Naresh, I can't remember if I told you this before, but one of the best storytellers that came to us when they applied to Illumina Accelerator was a person who was super passionate about working in an area that was personal to them. They had a history of sort of this specific, I don't want to reveal too much, but that had a history of this specific condition, not like life-threatening, could be life-threatening, but they kind of realized that genomics could play a role in helping understand and diagnose this condition. And so he came into our in-person interviews and kind of blew us all away. And he had a very clear, compelling reason of why this technology was important, why this was needed to be solved, and very clear, very succinct, told the story. I think he blew away all the other folks that day that that kind of came in for that in-person interview. But what was so remarkable about that, he was a high school junior. Oh, wow. (laughs) And he told the story in such a clear way. He didn't use buzzwords, but he brought in his co-founder who was a professor at Stanford. Obviously, he's a very impressive high schooler, (laughs) but he had such a clear story. And I think he saw it so simply in his mind. It was backed by deep science, but the storytelling, the narrative that he shared was very clean and crisp. And I think sometimes that's hard to do for folks, whether they're deep into the technology or sometimes when they're not even deep to the technology, but they're the ones who are used to making the decisions. Sometimes they're on the other side of the conversation whether they're an investor, whether they're a board member and used to being that way and not having to tell the story themselves and be sort of in the storytelling sort of role, that they struggled with that. Because you know a good story when you hear it, but sometimes it's hard to tell a good story. So we've seen it from both spectrums of somebody who's just innately good at storytelling, like this high schooler was, and deeply passionate about the topic, to somebody who's so deep in the tech that it's hard to kind of raise themselves out of that to kind of share their vision without kind of getting too far in the weeds. But then also folks who are sort of used to being so high level that it's hard for them to kind of get into the storytelling sort of mode where they can sort of tell a good story when they're used to really receiving good stories. So it's pretty fun to see the spectrum of folks in terms of how good a storyteller you are, but when you do it, you feel it. And when it's a success, that's when you, I think, are able to really attract folks around you to help you build your business. Did they get accepted to the program? The high schooler? The high schooler. We gave them a grant. And yes, they used the grant. <laughs> they went on to college, which I think is what that person needed to do. But they're still working on the startup. And I think hopefully either when they graduate or maybe like in their later years of school, they will continue on. But I know their research is still going on with their professor at Stanford as well. But yes. I'm so glad. I had to ask that question. Sorry. It's a fascinating story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's get into the facilities. What is the help they get in terms of sequencing and lab space? The second resource is sequencing, and you're right, a lot of it has to do with access to our lab. So we have a fully equipped lab space here in the Bay Area, just south of the airport, and also in Cambridge, UK, and Granta Park, right next to our, both are actually co-located with our innovation and our research and development sites in those locations. And what they get access to is our instruments, but I think probably more importantly, it's our expertise. So we have an amazing depth and breadth of expertise at Illumina that we try to tap into whether that's our chief technology officer or our distinguished scientists or our informatics specialists to really help the teams design 
plan and troubleshoot their experiments to make sure they're using the latest and greatest approaches and making sure they're generating high quality data that will lead to key value inflection milestones. And so that's through a lot of coaching and a lot of hard work to kind of help make sure the teams do that. Some of the teams come in as total sequencing experts and some are newer, but regardless when they come out, they all are sequencing experts. The teams, when they come on site, they're generating terabases and terabases of data, which we love. We love to see that the teams are not just generating data, but high quality data and not just generating high quality data, but really developing data that will help them achieve milestones to help them get to the next level of the company. So whether that's developing new IP that will help them approve out their concept or whether it's developing new methods that will then go out, they can secure patents around, or whether they're identifying new drug targets they can use for future drug discovery and development efforts. It's really, really cool to see the teams sort of generating all this data. And I think it's pretty unprecedented that, that this unparalleled access the teams have in getting access to the sequencers and sometimes early access to some of our technology to help them achieve these goals. Having seen this firsthand, I can vouch for this. It was really amazing, the kind of expertise we were having access to. You mentioned about offering expertise. So if there is any IP generated in collaboration with one of your scientists over there, what happens to that IP? Like who owns it and how does someone deal with it? Yeah, this is something that we're very mindful of because we want to make sure that we're a good partner to the entrepreneurs. Through the standard Illumina Accelerator agreements we have with the startups, we do not own the data. We do not have access to the IP. The startups generate and own all of their data, even if we sort of help them do that. If there's a real collaboration, so a separate agreement that was in place, and that might be more of a joint collaboration using our technology and their technology, then there is on a rare occasion some IP sharing, but that is really not the norm. Really, more importantly, it's to help these teams generate the data to help them build their company. And we do take an 8% common share stake in the companies. And we do that so that we're aligned with the entrepreneurs and the founders and that we're really incentivized to help them. So we take that equity stake to make sure that we have that potential upside when the teams go on and do great things. And our Illumina Accelerator team is measured by that as one of our metrics for success is the value that we create in these companies over time. That is good to know. So there are usually no conflicts of interest in terms of IP. You try to keep it clean. We try to keep it clean, and that's one of the reasons why we work with companies that are upstream or downstream of our core approach. We don't plan on, nor do we want to, acquire any of these companies. We're really trying to kind of grow the market and expand the applications of genomics and multiomics, rather than fill our internal innovation pipeline. That's not the goal. Our goal is to expand the market. Excellent. Can you walk us through the application process and the timelines? When do they apply? How long does it take for you to get back? And what are the timeframes they stay at the accelerator? Thanks for asking. So we're actually coming up to our next application deadline, which will be October 1st. So if folks are interested in applying, we love to kind of get to know folks. And usually how folks find us, it's pretty interesting. They find us through our website. You can go on our website and push apply now, which is easy to do. We have a four page application. We try to be super accessible and not a huge time commitment to just submit the application. We also hear about entrepreneurs from other founders. So other founders who have been through Illumina Acceler, like Naresh, yourself, sometimes come to us and suggest one of their friends apply to Illumina Accelerator. We, we love that. We make great, great entrepreneurs through our alumni and our portfolio companies. Some of the connections come through investors. So folks we've co-invested with in the past or folks who know the types of companies we look for. So a lot of VCs or sort of early stage investors will send us entrepreneurs to connect with. We love that as well. We also find folks that we're proactively looking for. We might go to a specific university and meet with one of their very prolific serial entrepreneur faculty. We've done that on a number of occasions and that's always fun. And then our commercial team. So Illumina's global sales team is at the kind of forefront of all the cool labs in different parts of the world that are working on genomics. And so sometimes we'll get folks to apply because our commercial team gives us a heads up that, hey, you might wanna to talk to this professor or this entrepreneur is interested in applying. We have a pretty broad kind of funnel of how we hear about folks, but we always do like to kind of connect with folks in advance. And so if you apply by October 1st, that's great. If you want to connect with us through an email or social or what have you, we're always happy to chat and tell you more about Illumina Accelerator. We're always doing events. We have a couple of events coming up to kind of spread the word. And usually we do that by having some of our portfolio companies come in and share their experiences in building a genomic startup. So we have a lot of ways we get to know companies but once they apply, we try to be very straightforward and mindful of their time because we know founders are very, very precious with their time. 
So we have one 15 minute phone call with them. We give them a template to fill out of a few slides to kind of help us understand the basics of what they do. We do the phone call to almost everyone who's in scope. So any, again, anybody who's sort of upstream or downstream of our core technology will have a phone call with. And we try to provide helpful feedback and ask helpful questions before, during, and after that session. And then for the finalists, we bring in on site if it's possible. These days we've been doing everything on Zoom, which has been working out okay as well. And so we bring them on to the final interviews and we'll do that for like a 30 minute interview. And that's where we bring in our selection committee and we'll just like anyone really try to evaluate their technology and their approach. And we really try to understand what the team is doing. The most important thing we look for in terms of selection is the team and the team dynamic. We're investing in people at this stage, even if the team is a little further along, even if they have IP, even if they have some ideas of a product, or even if they have a product, we're still backing the people. That's probably true for most investors, but because we're super early, that's the number one criteria we look for is the team dynamic. We select them, we do a little bit more diligence, and then we onboard them. So the selection and the onboarding process in total is about three months each, and the time on site is about six months. And then, of course, we're a shareholder, so we'd love to stay in touch with the teams even after they are part of the on-site cycle. Nice. Thank you for explaining that process. And what stage of the startups are accepted generally? It can vary. Sometimes we'll have two people with an idea on a whiteboard, no IP, but they've been thinking about this idea for a while and they have a clear sense of what they're trying to achieve. So we sometimes have that and maybe they've raised zero dollars or maybe they've just raised a little bit of friends and family capital. And then we have later stage companies who maybe raised a few million who have are coming to us maybe even more than a few million coming to us with already a pretty established team, but they know they want to do sequencing and they know they need sort of expertise and access to sort of our technology to take their company to the next level. And so that's also super fun because we're able to work with teams that are a little bit later stage, but help them develop new approaches, new methods, new IP, new data that will help take them to the next level. So it's a pretty broad range of companies. And these days, I feel like you're seeing just because there's so much capital coming into the space and so much great talent and so many creative ideas because of COVID. And I think all of the, I don't know, all of the side effects of <laughs> COVID, <laughs> side effects, some of it's silver lining, some of it's just the way it is. But I think we've gotten a lot of entrepreneurs and investors coming into the space. So it's, we've, just, we've been really inspired by, it. I think, the fresh ideas and the talent that's coming into the space right now. So we're really excited about what's to come. I'm super excited too. I think it took a pandemic for so much investments and attention to the healthcare startups at this level. So what happens after they graduate? Like what kind of support do you offer them once they move on? Yeah. So when the teams leave Illumina Accelerator, we kind of do, we kind of kick them out. It's kind of hard at the same time. because <laughs> It's hard to leave. It's hard to leave the place. Yes. <laughs> well, in the rest of your company, I think <laughs> you guys were already full steam, ready to go. I think it was easy to do, but in general, it's sort of like you have to let the startups sort of like leave the nest or move out of the dorms or live on their own because they have to be self-supporting and self-sustaining. And Lumen Accelerator provides a lot of infrastructure resources. Our space is like beautiful, I think, I'm biased. So it's hard to kind of figure out where to go next. A lot of our teams do end up going to other co-working spaces in the area, whether it's a co-working space in the UK or in the Bay Area or in Boston. They always find a home, but they have to be able to do that. They have to be able to sort of go out and stand on their own and get their own housing or their own apartment. But that said, they all do, and we're still around. They can come by and visit. We always are doing meetups and hangouts and online or in-person when we can, kind of events to stay connected. As I mentioned before, we're a shareholder in these companies, so we're incentivized to continue to help them. And a lot of the teams come back to us frequently for advice or for expertise, and we come back to them too for advice and expertise. So it's kind of a fun reciprocal relationship in a lot of ways, I think, with our portfolio companies. It's because we're all continuing to learn and learn from each other. And the founders are also learning from each other. The founders of other companies leverage each other's expertise, whether it's during the cycle or whether it's among the graduates of portfolios of companies. That alumni network of other Illumina Accelerator companies is also really strong. And that's a ton of fun for the other founders that are part of our portfolio. Excellent. You talked about the Cambridge and the San Francisco locations. I'm seeing, I think they're both a replica in terms of programming. And I saw something about the Sequoia Capital China Intelligent Healthcare Genomics Incubator. What is that about? You're exactly right, Naresh. The Illumina Accelerator is really one company creation engine. We have two sites. And so it's run as one cohort of companies. We just announced our recent batch cycle number three globally last week. So we have seven companies, three are in the Bay Area, four are in Cambridge, UK. And we really run that as one funding cycle. So that's co-located with our R&D sites at Illumina. And that is sort of a Illumina Accelerator, which is actually pretty different for what we're doing 
in China with Sequoia. So the Sequoia Capital China Incubator is in this case run by Sequoia in China for China. We're fueling it with our expertise and with our network, but it really is the hands-on day-to-day is being run by Sequoia. Sequoia is a fantastic partner, obviously a global like sort of top tier venture capital group and Neil Shen, the managing partner there. This is, I think, an important project for him, this incubator. And so we're really delighted to partner with them. We'll be announcing our first group of companies later this year, so stay tuned. But it is a very different model. We don't have an R&D site in China and Shanghai. Lumina doesn't have sort of like the same kind of presence that we do in the UK and in the Bay Area. So it's a very different model. But I think we're really fortunate to have a really world-class partner to help us achieve I think what our vision is, is really to partner with entrepreneurs in China to build new products and applications based on our sequencing and multiomics technology for China. So it's a ton of fun. We're just getting going. This is an amazing partnership. And this is in Shanghai, you said? In Shanghai, yep. Shanghai and Suzhou, they're doing some amazing things. I've been there a few years ago and their incubators are amazing. Sometimes they're like better than the ones in the US, I feel. They're investing a lot. In China, everything happens so fast and everything so the scale there is so significantly large. And so there's a lot of capital, there's a lot of talent, there's a lot of new ideas. And so it's just a different world out there for sure. Awesome. Thank you. Let's slightly shift the gears a bit. Thank you for explaining about the Accelerator program itself. I was talking to Brian Feth and James Lim from Excel Bio last week. Yes. For those listening, go listen to that podcast about Excel Bio. There's some excellent startup lessons in there. I believe this was one of the first startups that went through the program. What are the lessons you learned from leading that accelerator for the past seven years with regards to building successful startups? So Excel Bio, they're our first funding cycle, which was super cool. We've learned a lot since then. It has been a ton of fun. And I think the first three companies that we invested in, Encoded, Excel, and Epibiome, they made a big bet on us because we were just getting going. They kind of made a bet on Illumina being a good partner to entrepreneurs and helping them build their companies and taking their companies to reach to the next level. And so we're grateful for those companies for our first cycle in the world. All three of them have gone on to do really great things. So it's really kind of cool to see fast forward now seven years, that cycle number one started in November, 2014. So it was almost about exactly seven years ago. We now we've kind of worked with 61 companies and we've learned a ton and the world has changed in so many ways since then. Sequencing technology continues to decrease in cost. The accessibility continues to increase. The insight that you can generate from this technology has continued to increase. The investor community has really started to learn and has gotten really, really excited, not just because of COVID, but also before COVID, and sort of the power of genomics, which is really cool because you see the intersection between life science and data science. And the worlds converge with companies like ours because they're generating so much data. And they're having to sort of develop a lot of technology around that data, plus they're developing the life science applications on top of that. So it's really cool to see the life science and tech investors coming to invest in this field. That's been a really cool learning. I think whether it's a super early stage investor or a later stage investor, they're all kind of learning, I think, as the market is maturing or still not mature, still growing. But I think it's kind of cool to see how investors are kind of learning and educating themselves. And I think it's also cool to see how entrepreneurs are kind of continuing to find new ways to sort of leverage sequencing and sequencing data and expertise to build new companies. So, I mean, I guess what have we learned? We always kind of knew it was early days when we started Illumina Accelerator about seven years ago, but I think we still feel like it's still early days because the potential continues to sort of grow the applications, whether it's for human therapeutics or diagnostics or agriculture applications or consumer applications. We continue to still be inspired by these entrepreneurs who come to us with wild ideas that have become wildly successful. So it's a ton of fun. I mean, we've learned a lot about company building as well. We can share that as some tips there too, but I think some of them I've already kind of started to share. But I think we're constantly learning. I think the field is constantly learning. I think that entrepreneurs are constantly learning about how to build companies in this space. What was the wildest idea you heard of the 61 companies? Even if you passed something, something that was like so out of the world, anything that you can share? Well, maybe I'll just highlight, I don't know if it's the wildest one, but it's one of our new companies that we just announced. So maybe I'll highlight that one just because I think it's current. This company is Immu. So they're working in the direct-to-consumer space. And they have a very, very deep science approach to sort of understanding the immune profile of individuals based on their genome and based on multiomics information. And what's really cool with that is 
they're a very deep science company coming out of Caltech, which is my alma mater for my PhD. And they're coming at this from such a deep technical perspective, but they're 100% committed to sort of making this accessible to consumers. And I love that because no matter how unwavering people might challenge them and saying, hey, are you sure you got such great technology? Are you sure you want to apply this to the consumer space? And they're 100% sure about it because this is their vision. They want to really bring sort of these deep insights to consumers to help them navigate their personal health. So it's kind of fun. So I'm not sure if it's a wildest idea, but it's really, really interesting because we're kind of blown away by their vision and also their sort of technology expertise to kind of help them, I think, which will help them achieve their vision. I have to check out the company. I'll go Thank and browse you. that. <laughs> <laughs> what are the areas you see the most growth in, like in terms of trends? Like, is there a specific area you see more companies coming in? I don't know if it's a trend, but it's an area that I'm most passionate about, which is really unlocking the power of the human genome to improve human health really through developing and discovering novel therapeutics. I think there's a lot you can do in diagnostics. There's a lot you can do in other areas, which also we've invested in a ton, but about 40% of our portfolio is in the therapeutic space. And I think that's driven by a couple of things. A couple of things is we just really, really are excited about this new era of drug discovery and development, where you're really seeing the disease biology sort of being unlocked through enabling technologies like next generation sequencing. So it's so cool where we are and think in the history of understanding biology through these tools and other tools to kind of really understand biology. And with that, you can understand the biology, you can understand the disease, you can understand the target, identify novel targets. You can then try to find a modality that will hit that target. And then maybe you can identify which patients might respond to that treatment. And so that's really cool because if you really think about how are we going to sort of transform some of these indications, I think it really is by having a diagnosis, but also having a treatment for it. And so we spend a lot of time looking at novel therapeutics companies. And so I don't know if it's a trend, but I do think genomics is really, and multiomics is really going to sort of help us identify new drugs, new actionable sort of targeted precision medicines that will help patients. I completely agree with you. I think we are in the very, very early stages and sequencing is going to change a lot of the ways we treat diseases. And sticking to that subject, you are a co-founder of the program there, right? Where do you see this program going? And paint a colorful picture for us, like in 10 years, 20 years from now, what would you see as success? We started Illuminex back in 2014, about seven years ago, with really, it was our former chief technology officer's, his vision, Mustafa Renagi's vision to partner with entrepreneurs to unlock the power of the genome. He's a startup junkie. He loves entrepreneurship. He loves is. Sort of, yeah, right? I know you got to know him well. And so it was his vision of kind of Illumina having an accelerator. And when I actually heard about it, I was kind of skeptical. Most corporates want to do good by entrepreneurs, but most corporates struggle how to do good because companies are big and there's a lot of just other factors they have to weigh in. But when I got to meet Mustafa, I was like, okay, I see he's an entrepreneur and he really wants to sort of create something that will be flexible and will ensure Illumina is a good partner to entrepreneurs. So that's what we did. But now 61 companies in, they've all raised collectively about a billion dollars and we're still getting going. I think Illumina Accelerator itself shouldn't scale too big. Illumina Accelerator is as Illumina's company creation engine sort of owned and run by Illumina, co-located with our R&D sites. That should only be in a few locations across the globe. We shouldn't work with too many companies because I think if we worked with too many companies, maybe I'll be wrong, this is my prediction. <laughs> we work with too many companies across the globe, even as Illumina grows, we shouldn't grow too big because you really want to be a hands-on company creation engine. If you look at the best VCs, some of them do, but most of them don't have sites all over the globe where they're really hands-on creating dozens and dozens of companies a year. They're selectively creating companies to really kind of, I think, build the most impactful companies per year. So it's about quality, not quantity. So Lumina Accelerator itself, maybe we'll scale a little bit to other locations, but I don't think we're going to scale a lot. But how we do scale is by partnering with the ecosystem. That's what it's all about. So partnering with ecosystem players and other co-investors like Sequoia in China. I'm really excited about that partnership. I think obviously for many reasons, Sequoia is I think the obvious choice and a fantastic choice in China. And they have local expertise. They have sort of a really great keen sense of the market. And I think together we'll be able to sort of, I think do a lot, but I think in different geography, we're gonna be looking at different models with different partners of how do we partner with entrepreneurs and VCs to help grow, launch, and create genomic startups. And so this sort of broader, expanded vision that we have, it goes beyond Illumina Accelerator. It includes Illumina Accelerator. I think Illumina Accelerator will always be our flagship. But the broader strategy, actually, now we're going through a rebranding, which will be Illumina for Startup. 
So again, Illumina for Startups will be sort of the broader umbrella where we kind of partner with entrepreneurs and investors across the globe. But we have different models for different geographies to kind of help entrepreneurs create companies. So Illumina, et cetera, will still be our flagship, but we'll find new models like we did in China to kind of help kind of expand and partner with entrepreneurs to help them unlock the potential. Thank you so much for sharing that vision. I'm from a school of thought, in your school of thought, that the quality matters than the quantity. Having the right partners matter, and it's going to be a worldwide need, but you're in a good place to grow those startups. Thank you for your time. Really, I appreciate this, Amanda. How can people connect with you? And are there any last plugins before we head out? Oh, thanks, Rush. This has been a ton of fun. I'm so glad you're doing this. I can tell you're having a lot of fun with your podcast. So thanks for including <laughs> us. But how do we get in touch? So LinkedIn is always the best that so we have Illumina for Startups on LinkedIn. So follow us, direct messages, come to one of our events. We have a couple of events coming up. We have one this Friday on Clubhouse and one next week, which will be sort of a Zoom. And we're always looking to engage. So apply by October 1st. That's like the key action here for any entrepreneur who's thinking or even sort of slightly thinking about starting a company. Don't wait to apply. The more we get to know you, I think the better chances you are to be accepted once you are ready. So don't wait to apply. And Naresh, I think just in general, thank you so much for all that you do to help build the entrepreneurial ecosystem. I know you're a passionate entrepreneur yourself, and we're really grateful for everything that you do with the podcast. And then just in general, all your positivity, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Amanda. This has been so much learning for me. I've learned a lot from you today. A lot of things I didn't know about. Thank you for everything. So I hope there'll be a lot of good startups and they'll change the world. Thank you for your time. Appreciate Absolutely. This. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Lab to Startup podcast. You can find links to the resources and programs mentioned in these episodes, connect with Naresh, or subscribe to this show at labtostartup.com. <laughs>